All right, guys, we are back with another seminar. We've got uh, Mike Del Visco. Uh, guys, if you didn't see the sonar uh, discussion that he has, uh, man, he does a great job. Um, so no brand-specific thing, just a, a really good uh, overview of, of sonar, sonar concepts. I learned a lot yesterday. I think you're going to get a lot out of this. Uh, if you consider yourself an absolute expert on sonar, then you can probably skip this one. But uh, I bet you'll learn a thing or two. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to uh, turn the camera around and uh, we'll get him uh, rolling here in just a few minutes. We rolling, Mike? All right. Welcome, everybody. Um, the first annual Alabama Fishing Expo in Gadsden. Um, I'm happy to be here. I actually work with these show people too. I do all the social media live um, uh, filming and all that stuff. So if you watch social media, that's me hosting that stuff too. And, uh, and I do a lot of the seminar work with some of the guys and I'm also a professional bass fisherman. So I do quite a bit of things in the fishing industry. And one thing that I specialize in is sonar. And I've done this for a number of years. Um, I've worked with a bunch of companies developing product and still do now. And I teach people how to understand their sonar a little bit better. And that's what I'm going to do this afternoon for you guys. Um, I'll tell you a quick story before we get going. Um, I fished my first, how old are you? Okay. So senior in high school? Junior? Um, I fished my first major tournament when I was a senior in high school. And it was a Bassmaster Invitational. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, back then, 42 years ago, that was the only professional. You know, there was local tournaments and regional tournaments, but the Bassmaster Invitationals was it. If you wanted to go to the Bassmaster Classic, that's what you fished. So Roland Martin fished them, Jimmy Houston fished them, Rick Clun fished them, Larry Nixon fished them. All the guys that the legends all fished those tournaments. And I fished one while I was a senior in high school. And back then, we didn't have much electronics to go find a fish or catch a fish. This tournament was on Thousand Islands, which is St. Lawrence River, which flows into Lake Ontario. Pretty big body of water. And the very first day of the tournament, I get paired up with a guy named Forrest Wood. Pretty awesome to be a senior in high school and get to go fish with Forrest Wood. Ranger boats. Um, we had a great day fishing. We didn't catch many fish, but we had a we had a really really fun time fishing. Ran way up the river um, to some places where I thought we could catch them, but we didn't. Um, here's where the story comes in. The second day, I draw a guy out named Joe Thomas. And if you've ever watched Ultimate Match Fishing, Steel's Reel in the Outdoors. Um, if you're a hunter, he hunt, he uh, hosts two different hunting shows. Um, he was my second day partner. So he comes to the hotel room and we discuss where we're going to fish and how we're going to fish the next day. That was customary back then. And uh, I said, well, Joe, where are we going to go fish? And he says, we're going to go to a place called Shamo Bay. And I hadn't heard of Shamo Bay. And I said, well, Joe, where is Shamo Bay? And he pulls a napkin out of his pocket with a Sharpie drawn on him and goes, well, it's right here. You go down the lake and go into the mouth of Lake Ontario and you go down about 30 miles and you go around the big point and you go in there and, and there's Shamo Bay. I said, well, I go, okay. So I rode with him in his 18-foot Skeeter boat and his 150-horsepower motor and 8-foot waves down Lake Ontario in a thunderstorm and hurricanes. And uh, we made it to Chameau Bay three and a half hours later after takeoff. No GPS, no fish finders. We had flashers on the boat. And, and maybe if you were lucky, you had... Um, something that looked like that. A lot of boats had those on them. Basic. Basic sonar. It read the bottom. It maybe showed you some stuff, showed you a little bit, showed you how deep the water is. We didn't have mapping or GPS. Side scan, down scan, live sonar, 360 scan, all of this different technology we didn't have. Our mapping system back then was get your paper map, Put it on the floor of the boat, get plexiglass. I learned this trick really early too. Um, 
get some plexiglass and put it on the map so you can put your foot on it and drive down the lake. That was our map system. Cost about $1.98. Get you some plexiglass from the hardware store. Um, if you try to hold your map in your hand and drive down the lake at 50 miles an hour, well, I found out you get about that much map in your hand left and you can't find your way back because you don't have a map anymore. Um, so we got pretty smart at doing that. So there's a lot of little tricks that I still use today that I'm going to share with you guys, but um, over the years things have changed, haven't they? Now we've got, I, I just set a new boat up the other day, and I've got a 16-inch screen up front, I've got two 12-inch screens on the console, um, and you can even do more. I've seen guys with three machines up front, three and a, some of that's overkill. I mean, I, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with having two on the console, one up front. Doesn't really matter what, what you've got, what you fish with, what you fish out of, because all sonar works the same way. And I think understanding the basics of how all this stuff works. Like regular two-dimensional sonar, regular 2D sonar, it's on every single fish finder from one that's 100 bucks to one that's 6,000. If you can understand how to read 2D sonar and understand what it's telling you as far as bottom content, fish, brush, rocks, things like that, you can learn every other type of sonar too, whether it's side scan, down scan, 360, um, the live stuff if you're starting to do that. So let's take a look at actually how it works. And it doesn't matter if it's a hummingbird, a Garmin, a Lowrance, whether it's 20 years old or made yesterday. Um, your transducer, which is connected, <coughs> excuse me, to the back of your sonar unit, sends down a pulse when you turn it on. Sound travels at 4,800 feet per second through the water. It hits the bottom, it returns something back, tells you how deep water is. That's how it works. Um, we got any crappie fishermen out here? I live on Douglas Lake in East Tennessee. And two weeks ago, there was about 30 guys out in front of my house crappie fishing. It's a depth thing. It happens every single year. Sometimes it's a little earlier, sometimes it's a little later. Um, this year it happened a little bit later than usual because the water's been low. Um, the water just starts to come up, the water depth gets right, all those crappie fishing, boom, right there in front of my house. They were living right there on the edge of those flats, to drop off into the channels, getting ready to move up. And, and that's where they are for a couple of weeks, and then, then they all move. Um, <coughs> situational stuff, bass fishing, crappie fishing, striper fishing, cat fishing, all fish like different depths. So having the fish finder tell me what depth it is is pretty important. But I'm going to tell you some stuff about how to identify different types of bottom. Because if we've ever heard the... Um, old saying that 90% of the fish live in 10% of the lake. It is really true. And that's what I'm trying to find when I'm out there looking, is I want to find those little subtle spots that other people miss. The 90% of fish that live in 10% of the lake in that tiny little spot. This is really important in understanding how much I'm seeing and being able to find stuff again after I've gone over it once. <coughs> and you can go through your menu screen, turn your 2D sonar on, hit menu on any brand, and see frequency. Frequency governs how much the cone is, what size the cone is, because sonar isn't a cone. The deeper you go, the more stuff you look at on the bottom. If I'm shallower, I look at less. If I'm deeper, I look at more. So when you turn your menu screen on, you go to frequency, you might see 200 kilohertz, you might see 83, or you might see 50. There's not many transducers now that run that 50 kilohertz frequency. It's a big wide beam, um, saltwater fishing, um, Great Lakes stuff, trout fishing, salmon fishing, stuff like that. That's when that works really good. Most of the time you'll see these two. You might also see <coughs> <coughs> chirp frequency. You might see high, medium, or low. And all chirp does, 200 is high, 83 is medium, 50 is low. And the chirp frequency varies that frequency up and down a little bit <clears throat> to give you a better picture. So if you're fishing places like Gunnersville 
and the fish are down in the grass and they're a little bit deeper. It has better separation quality. Gives you a little bit cleaner picture. Um, fall of the year, when there's a lot of bait fish on top of the water and you want to see the fish around them too that you're trying to catch, a little bit better separation quality. Um, if you're fishing really deep, and I'll show you, I've got a slide at the end that um, shows pretty good about what chirp frequencies does. Just makes your picture look a little bit different. For the most part, if I'm bass fishing, crappie fishing, striper fishing, I'm 30 foot deep and under typically. Um, here's how to know how much you're looking at on the bottom. The bottom's at 30 feet. The cone diameter in that depth of water is just under 10 feet. 9.7 something, I guess. Um, so when I drive over something and I see it on my screen, it's within a 10 foot circle underneath my boat. So it might be a few feet that way, a few feet this way, a few feet that way, or like that. When I change this to the higher or lower frequency, I should say, I'm almost doubling that area. So there's 200. I turn to the lower frequency and I almost double it. So if I actually drive over something and I see it on the screen, it could be anywhere around here in that lower frequency. So you see more stuff, but I don't have a pinpoint um, accuracy on the cover of the fish that I'm trying to fish for. That's why I like 200. Yeah, 30 feet deep, you're talking like double what you were, what you were looking at before. Um, <clears throat> there's a time when that higher fre or lower frequency does come in. I'm going to show you that at the end. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about how to identify different things in the water. Because a lot of times, especially, um, we use Gunnersville ex again for an example. There's miles and miles of you know, grass and cover and things for fish to be in. Um, but you don't catch them everywhere you go. I don't anytime I go there. Sometimes you're looking, searching all day long. Boom, you come on a group of fish and you catch a whole bunch. Um, same thing with where I live in East Tennessee on Douglas Lake. Um, it has a lot of transition banks, soft bank, hard bank, gravel, rocks, boulders. All these things look different on your screen. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and there's one adjustment that you can make on every single unit that will make this look a little bit better. And what's happened is that that sonar is sending a pulse down in the water. The softer bottom absorbs the sonar and makes a straight yellow line. The hard bottom repels it and will make either a thicker yellow line or what I wanna do is I wanna make some red on top of that. And there's an adjustment called color. If you're fishing with Lorance stuff, it's called color line. <coughs> and Garmin is called color gain. And Hummingbird is contrast. And I'll tell you, because I don't know what everybody fishes with, um, Lowrance is somewhere between 76 and 80%. You adjust it somewhere in there, it's, it's usually fine. Uh, the Garmin would be minus three and the hummingbird is 12, 13, or 14. Right there in that range is usually the best. And what I recommend is drive over something that you know that's got hard bottom and make that adjustment and you'll see some red shading on top of the yellow and that's what we're trying to do because that's one little rock right there. That also has a very good bearing on <coughs> excuse me, what your fish look like. And I ask this question quite a bit every time I do this seminar, is this is a simulator picture in a store that was running a, circling through their views of their fish finders. And that's designed to show you what fish look like. Arches, some are big, some are small, some are different shapes, bait fish, bigger fish, real big fish. Um, smaller fish. How many sees that many fish when they go out and go fishing? If they do, I'm staying an extra day in Alabama. We're going fishing tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, I'd fish right here. Um, there's your hard bottom, by the way. That red, yellow to red, back to yellow again. There's your transition right there. 
This is, these are probably trees or brush, but I want you to look at all these fish. They're all different sizes. And they're thicknesses too. So that's what I look for with that color line set the right way. When I'm seeing fish arch on my screen, I look for the thickness of that line. Um, anybody catfish? So catfish are really just, well, the catfish that you want to catch, um, a big giant one will be really distinctive on your screen. And if you think of maybe a 30, 40, 50 pound catfish, it's a big, it's that big. And the head is really hard and you will get different shades of colors throughout the whole body of the fish, depending upon if you're scanning over his head or not. Um, bass look a different way. Crappie are typically blotchy and red. You know, red marks, blotchy red marks. Stripers are usually noodly, like a bunch of noodles on your screen. Um, bass are typically three, four, five little marks like that. These could be carp or something. Those are really big red marks. <coughs> But one thing <coughs> to realize is that they're not always going to arch on your screen. And again, it doesn't matter what brand machine you have, how old it was, sonar works this way. Now, if you're in your boat and you're idling along, the boat moves, the transducer moves, the transducer goes over the fish, the fish does that. That's how it arches. That's how it did it. 40 years ago in that tournament is how it does it now. And if it doesn't, it's not going to arch. Now, those are true arch marks from my machine right there. But if the fish doesn't arch and only catches the edge of the cone, you may see something that looks like that. Straight lines. I, I get more people that raise their hand that see stuff like this than arches all over their screen. Um, when I see that picture right there, those are feeding fish, feeding through the water column. And you notice there's some red in here in this purple too, bigger fish. So I've got things separated by size with that color line adjustment. Um, so typically, if they're moving, you see more of a straight line. It, if, they're, if they're doing this, they're actually swimming through the water column. So those are like stripers or white bass that are feeding on bait and they're, they're swimming around. Typically what I'll see, if I see a couple of arch marks like this, um, and then I put my boat in neutral, the arches will almost pretty immediately go from this to flattening out, and you'll just see kind of straight lines. Um, so I'm not necessarily ruling out that I'm not seeing fish on the screen just because they're not gonna arch. That's kind of my point with this. Um, if you think about the math again, when we are talking about 30 foot of water, the circle being 10, what if you're only in 15 foot? Now this circle on the bottom becomes five. What's the chance of me being in 10 foot of water, fishing something and having a fish swim right through my trolling motor cone? Pretty slim. I'm gonna see more fish, straight lines, blips, dots, going this way when I'm just fishing. I'll see more fish that will arch when I'm moving. Now if we look at our original picture again, this is how quick it happens. One arch right there, straight, 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 straight. Happens pretty fast. So I'm always kind of paying attention to how much red's in there. Is there bait around too? If they're blotchy, they'll be crappie. Straight lines will be bass. Um, wavy lines will be stripes and, and big arches like that will be um, catfish or bigger fish. <coughs> okay. So I don't adjust many things. Um, there's a couple. A lot of the newer day units run pretty good on the software that's built into them. But um, these two, I missed it. The two things that you saw right back there, um, noise rejection and surface clarity. Typically, um, in most of your fiberglass boats, you can set both of those to low and be fine. Um, all that does is clean up the top of your screen a little bit and, and some of the noise from other sonar units running, stuff running in your boat, live well pumps, whatever. Um, but aluminum boats, 
usually have externally mounted transducers because you can't glass through a, a 2D transducer in an aluminum boat. So you get a little bit more wave slap, a little bit more noise. Um, sometimes I might go to medium on both of those. So turn your surface clarity to medium, turn your noise rejection to medium. Don't go to high because you tend to block out some of your fish. Um, and maybe a combination of low and medium too will clean your machine up a little bit. Other than that, the other real big adjustment is <coughs> sensitivity or gain. And depending upon what unit you're, you're talking about, Garmin calls it gain and Hummingbird and Lorenz call it sensitivity. Um, I want to adjust up or down so that I'm able to separate my bottom from my cover from my fish. And this is a, uh, a 20 foot deep flat on Kentucky Lake, pretty flat, pretty soft bottom that drops off into the river channel, 60 some odd feet down here. There's your hard bottom right there on the edge because it turned red. Color line is set right. But I've got really good separation between all of this now because of the way my sensitivity is set. I see these fish over here. I see these fish here. And I can tell you just by idling over that area, looking at the screen, where I'm going to fish and probably what I'm going to throw. Because I know the fish are above the brush pile and they're around cover. Those are the ones I'm going to target. You think of any kind of fish, crappie, catfish, striper, bass, doesn't matter what it is. If they're going to ambush their prey, they're going to be around some type of structure. These ones over here are just swimming around. Don't care about these fish. I care about those ones because I could probably catch them easier. Knowing that they're in about 10 foot of water eliminates a lot of different baits. They're not on the bottom, so I'm not going to throw a plastic worm or a Carolina rig or a football jig. I'm going to throw something that is above their line of sight. DT-10 crankbait, swim bait, spinner bait, top water. If, if the water's warm enough, I can get them to come up. Um, that sort of thing. A whole lot easier to target those fish once you know where they are. Um, Gunnersville, for example, again, grass. And that grass grows out down along the edge of the river channel and it drops off and you might have grass that grows up, you know, eight or 10 foot off the bottom. One of the keys to Gunnersville is finding those areas of that river channel that have a hard bottom associated with them. And it's not everywhere. Sometimes it'll be soft bottom, soft bottom for a mile, and then one little shell bed, and there's 100 bass sitting right on it. And uh, I'll show you some stuff on side scan about how to identify shell beds a whole lot easier too. Um, but that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for that, you know, 90% of the fish that are in that little 10%. That's exactly what we're trying to find and we're trying to use sonar to do it. Um, let's talk briefly about what these objects are. And they're brush piles with the exception of one. Um, that's a brush pile. That is one. And that is one right on the edge. And this, because it's really red and dense, is a concrete foundation, almost like an old bridge abutment that somebody put three brush piles around. Now they're different size brush piles, which is why each one of them looks different. The first one, a little bitty one, only you know, four foot or so off the bottom, a really small brush pile, more compact. Going back to how I set that color line, I see more red in the smaller brush pile because it's more compact, more dense. I don't have a lot of space around there to see anything else. This bigger one, which comes up off the bottom about eight or 10 feet, think about a brush pile that had been in there a long time, or maybe the, you know, all the branches are kind of separated a little bit. Now, you know, bear in mind, this is 2D sonar, not downscan, which we, you would see every single branch. That's why I get a little bit more density here, a little less here, and some fish up on top. Same thing with that one. <coughs> If you were to adjust that color line way down or way up, things would turn all red or, or all yellow, and you wouldn't get any contrast between them. But because it's set right, you're able to tell the difference between stuff. And that's exactly the way I want to set it. Um, now, sensitivity to be able to get some good separation, 
if the water's you know, 15 foot and deeper and, and I'm around cover, whether it's brush or grass, I want to um, increase my sensitivity a little bit. A couple of two or three clicks until you start to see some, a good picture. If you get in shallow water, like 10, 12 feet, 8 feet, and, and your picture looks all kind of combined, you want to decrease your sensitivity a little bit. Not a whole bunch, just a little bit. And you'll start to see a better picture. Other than those two, um, the color line sensitivity, I don't touch many other things. I think the next one is side scan. Oh, no, the next one's rock. This is a, uh, I need to move this slide. That is what a rock pile looks like. Color line set right. You can almost see each individual rock on 2D sonar. I don't see a fish on there, by the way, so not fishing it today, but that's just an underwater rock pile out here on the end. You can see almost every single boulder. Side scan. Probably the most questions that I get on sonar is got to do with this screen right here, side scan. Um, Yeah, you sure can. Back on the far side, I saw 200 megahertz. Is you running most of the 200 megahertz? Yes, uh, two, 200 kilohertz. 200 kilohertz. Yep. Yeah, most of the time. I'll show you. I got a slide at the end when I change it, but that's probably the only time that I do. <coughs> yeah. Yes. Yep. Yep. Um, this is side scan. So regular sonar scrolls this way across your screen. Side scan scrolls from the top going down. So we're looking out um, 100 feet this way and 100 feet that way from your boat position, which is right there. And it's in a cone too. So if you took that cone like this and you turned it sideways going to the right and sideways going to the left, that's what you're seeing. So you got a cone that way, one this way, one straight down. We take that, and we see where we're looking, and we're going out this way, out to the right, straight down. There's going to be, <coughs> depending upon the depth of the water, a place where you don't see anything on your side scan, and that is here and here, because the cone's not wide enough to see the bottom yet. That's this box and that box. And then you see your bottom, see your bottom here. That's this one and that one. So boat transducer, solid line, two black boxes, water column, ball, uh, pallet bottom will be your structure all along the bottom. And I look for coloration changes, changes in, in contour in the bottom, all kinds of little things. And there's a couple of things that you can do um, to enhance the screen quite a bit. And the first one is changing your palettes. And <clears throat> usually default, most everybody's machine comes, I think the, the Garmin comes with what's called rusted steel. That's like their default palette. Um, Lawrence is number six which is this color, and I think Hummingbird is the same thing. Um, I, on all three units, I like to go to amber because amber shows up contrast better. It shows up fish better. It just has an all-around better view to find stuff. So all you would do is go, <coughs> go to your menu screen and go to either appearance or view and, and get all your different palette colors. And there's 10 of them to choose from, probably even more on some units. Uh, number 10 on the Lowrance is the amber one. And then the blue one I really like. Um, if it's dark or cloudy out, the blue looks real good. But it makes your fish look different too. Because fish don't arch on your side scan. They're dots in blips. And there's a few over here too. They will be bright yellow on your amber palette and they will be white on your blue palette. It, 
It does unless you contrast things right. Because you'll see some smaller ones too, like crappie and stuff will be like little dots, but they don't, a real big one's going to be a real big blip on your screen, but it's, there's not a lot of difference between things. Um, typically, if I'm bass fishing and I see a big wad of stuff on the screen, it's, it could be bait fish, could be a bunch of stripes, could be white bass. You're not going to see, you know, a hundred fish and, and they're going to be bass. You'll see four or five in a school. Um, stripers will, will typically be longer lines and you'll see a, a great many more of them. Um, I also look for shadows under the fish too, um, especially a big school of stripers that's out, you know, in 30, 40 foot of water. You'll see the shadow under them as well. You know, that, that sort of thing is what I look for. But um, yeah, a lot of the real tiny ones, it'll, you won't really see them. But if you contrast things right, things appear a lot better and you're able to read your screen better. Um, there's a few things that <clears throat> really help in determining how good things are going to look. And range is the first thing. Now you can just go to your range and you can press automatic. And your side scan will adjust automatically depending upon the depth of your water. And it does it four times the distance. So 20 foot of water, I'm looking at 80 feet. 25 foot, I'm looking at 100. 50 foot, I'll look at 200. But what if I get in shallow water? I'm out here fishing on Neely like I was the other day with Dano, and we were in uh, one point, well, the deep, the deep stuff was 1.6 feet. Um, it was, uh, anybody see, watch that live? Me and Dano on, on live on Bucks Island. Um, yeah, we were in, uh, he was turning mud the whole time. Um, but pretty shallow. So if you're in like eight feet, looking out 32 feet doesn't do me any good. I want to look out further to be able to find stuff. So what I like to do is go to my, typically, go to my menu screen and go to range and go to any desired distance that I like. I like 100 to 120 most of the time. You can go up to 500. We're going to put it on 200 here just so you can see the, the coverage that you get. And coverage depends a lot on frequency, an awful lot on it. If you um, look at your frequency, again, I don't know what everybody's fishing with, Garmin, Hummingbird, Lowrance. Um, until this year, Lowrance only had 455 and 800 kilohertz frequency side scan. Um, Hummingbird led the industry with mega imaging, real high definition, beautiful, brilliant pictures of what the bottom looks like. You see them in the stores and Cabela's and, you know, Hummingbird booth over here. Pictures look great. The thing to understand about high frequency is that the higher the frequency you go, the smaller the cone gets. So if I'm in 40 foot of water, I'm trying to look 100 feet, and I turn my ultra high depth frequency on and the beam shortens to this, do I ever get it to go where it needs to go to see the bottom? No. Higher frequency, shorter distance. Sometimes I'll use 455, sometimes I'll use the 800. Um, typically I like 80 to 100 feet with the 800 um, in water that's 25 foot and less. If I'm going deeper than that and I'm trying to scan, maybe um, uh, you go to a lake that's got some bluff banks or, you know, you're out here on Neely and you're upriver and, and the water's really deep and all the banks come off really steep and you want to look up under those trees or those lay downs or boat docks, um, the 455 works really good for that because you're able to open the beam up and see stuff as opposed to shortening it and not seeing much at all. Um, enables me to see the cover better, enables me to see the fish better. Um, when I go to different frequencies, however, I need to change my contrast a little bit to make it look good. <coughs> um, the lower the frequency, the lower the contrast I need. So when I go to 455, if I had it on 800 and I change it to 455, you'll notice that your picture looks totally different. It's much more washed out, so I need to use contrast to eliminate some of that glare 
and it'll, you'll start to see a much better picture. Go down, keep going down, 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 and contrast until your picture looks nice. Um, higher frequency, higher gain. Sure. Um, overall size. Yeah. Yep. And in diameter. In order to get those pictures that you see, it, it's pretty direct. Yeah. It's almost like taking a flashlight and shining it into a bunch of trees. If you've got a if you got a beam that big, you're gonna see more stuff. If you've got one this big, you're gonna see less. But when you see something with that, you're gonna know it's Pretty close, the boat. But yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and, and a lot of it has to do with depth of water too. So if you're in 80 foot, you could perceivably get a really good picture with a high frequency, um, depending upon the depth of your water. If you're in 10 foot of water and you're going 100 feet, yeah, you'll get a good picture because the beam. It, it's got enough distance with the size of the beam to be able to see what it needs to see. But once you get deeper, you'll see more water column and less bottom. It's just all, all sonar basically is is math. Yep. I look for, um, hope this is an, oh man, it's not. Um, I wonder if I can go backwards. Can I go backwards? I can't go backwards. One thing I look for, um, stop this thing, um, on my side scan too is I will look for shading of bottom. So one, um, one area is really bright, another area has got some shadow or darker um, images on it, and that's typically like a, a drop or a transition. Um, ditches, you know, if you're... <coughs> If you're crappie fishing or whatever, or even bass fishing, and you're idling down the bank, and you can watch the, the shoreline where the, the bank would kind of turn like this, and you see where that little trough is, well, that's a ditch coming out into the channel. <coughs> you will see that in different colors. So it might be really bright on top, a little darker where the deeper water is, and then bright again. And sometimes you'll see fish lined right up, little dots lined up in those ditches. Those are great places to use your side scan to go find some fish. Um, one thing about, um, we are talking about looking in like Gunnersville in the grass, is <clears throat> there's one, um, and I wish I could go backwards to show you the palette. There's one that's a um, purple to like really bright yellow palette on Lowrance, and I think it's, um, on Garmin, it's the rusted steel one that it looks similar to. And I don't know, I've never tried to turn it on in the Hummingbird, but that one is a real bright palette. And, and it's, it looks like it's really flashy, like it's almost too bright. That's a really good one for finding those shell beds because the shell beds are not, it's not like driving over rock. It's more of a subtle hard bottom, if that makes any sense. And it will really light up on those two palettes and, and let you see them really good. Um, this is um, some of the cool new stuff that's out live. It, it's called, now they call it forward facing sonar. Um, it used to be called live scope because Garmin came out with it first. So that's what everybody was doing. They were live scoping. Now you're, I guess now you're forward facing sonar because everyone's got one. Hummingbird's got one. Lawrence has got one. Garmin's got one. And you can look straight down with this transducer. You can look out to the side or forward like we're doing now. So transducers here, we're looking out 60 feet. This area right here is back under the boat a little bit. So we're looking out at this drop straight ahead. Or you can also look what they call <coughs> scout or perspective. And what that does is down would be like this forward would be like this and scout takes the transducer and turns it sideways like a fan 
Now, this is not in a cone like regular sonar is, so you're not looking, if, if you're looking straight down, there's not a lot side to side that you're looking at. There's more this way, not a lot that way. If you're looking forward, you're not looking at much this way, but you're looking at a lot that way. Perspective is not much this way, but a lot that way, if that makes a sense. Um, so depending upon the orientation your transducer's in, you might see stuff and you might not. It just really depends on where you're pointing things at. Now, I had one of the first Lawrence transducers that could do this that existed, and I put it on the boat. I didn't know how to adjust it. I didn't, I almost, I didn't even know how to put it on. But I got it on the boat, didn't make any settings, drove to a brush pile on my lake, dropped it in the water, and this is what happened. Okay, I'm looking straight down. So I'm looking at a lot this way <coughs> and not much that way. There is a brush pile right here, and I'm actually going to move the trolling motor a little bit so I can see the other brush pile that's over here and watch what happens as I turn like that. One, two, three, four fish come swimming out, and they go swimming to the other brush pile that's over on the other side. Now, I know there's some flashing stuff and some stuff. I don't even know how to adjust this thing. There's a few adjustments to clean all that stuff up. And this was the first one before it ever came out in the market. Um, so they look a lot better now. But I'm all excited because I'm going to catch one as I'm recording this. So I drop my bait down, and down it goes, and down it goes. And you'll see it a couple more times. You'll see these fish swimming around the brush like they are right there. And I'm not catching any. They're not coming out of the brush. They're not coming to look at my bait. They don't care about it at all. And one thing I learned <coughs> early on is just because you see them on your screen doesn't mean you're going to catch them. I have yet to find a magic button on a fish finder that you can press it and the fish that you see on your screen will come eat your bait. <clears throat> what I do notice is that I can trigger fish sometimes. If I see them, I can tell how they're acting, how they react with other fish, how they react in the bait, <clears throat> how they react in the cover, how they react to my bait that I'm throwing at them. Rate of fall, different colors, things like that. It's no different if anybody fishes shallow, and I love, shallow fishing is my preferred way to go fish. Um, sometimes if you're out there fishing heavy cover in the summertime, instead of throwing a little tiny quarter ounce jig in a foot of water, you throw one that's a half ounce or a one ounce, and, and you get it in there and it falls real quick and it triggers the fish into biting. They bite it before they ever know what it is. Same thing here, instead of my little drop shot or whatever I'm, <coughs> whatever I'm throwing down there, it's going down, 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 down. They're looking at it the whole way, and I'm sitting there shaking it up and down. Something that drops really fast, like a jigging spoon or a, a much heavier jig head with a little fish body on it, something I can get down to them quicker, boom, and they eat it and triggers. The other time I'll get bit is if I all of a sudden see one come into the view which will happen right about there. See that one pop up? Remember, you're not looking at a lot sideways. It's not like a, like a cone that you're looking in a big giant circle. It's a small area. That one saw my bait, swam into the view area, and decided to take a bite out of it. And, of course, I pulled it right out of his mouth and he swam away. That happens, too. Sitting there watching my screen. Oh, he's going to bite it. Pull it right out of his mouth. But it happens. So I catch a lot of fish that I, if I don't catch them immediately when I see them on the screen, I will catch the one that usually turns into the screen to eat my bait. Forward view is how I like 
to fish most of the time because I can look out around, I can scan a big area, I can go out about 80 feet. <coughs> this is the same brush pile as I was looking at before, only I'm looking at it forward instead of straight down. You get a much better picture straight up and down on it, a little bit different orientation looking sideways at it. But I can still tell fish, I can still tell cover. Um, one thing that I do <coughs> in forward, I may go 80 feet, 70, 80, 90 feet out forward. Once I get to where I want to fish, I'm getting closer, closer, closer. I'm going to down my range back to about 30 feet so that things appear much better. Your fish change their perspective, how they look. All the ones that were blipping and dotting and looking like circles will change in elongate if they're bigger fish. If they stay like that, I don't want to catch them. But if they start to elongate, there's some more not eating my bait either. Um, those are the ones that I want to catch. So um, 30 makes your whole world look better when you're fishing forward. So forward view, perspective view, that's, that's scout. I don't fish with that much. Typically, um, shallow water springtime fishing, it's nice because I can, I can scan a big flat. Uh, fall of the year when the bait gets up top of the water and there's fish are schooling everywhere and you want to try to track them down, that's when that mode comes in because you're only looking at a top little bit of the water, but you're looking at a big area this way. Um, if you don't have a live transducer on your boat and you want to see your drop shot bait or your jigging spoon or something you're dropping down on the fish and you want to see your line and see your bait, here's what you do. If I'm in deep water, I will go to my frequency and this is the one time that I change it. I will go to frequency and pick one of two things. Um, I have medium chirp selected right here because I'm in 72 foot of water. If I was in less water, you know, 30, 40 foot, I'd probably just go to regular 83 kilohertz, it's the same thing. But I wanted to be able to see these fish in the bottom a little bit better, so I use my chirp so I can see them. Now these are school of bass, school of spotted bass, and they're kind of settling back down on the bottom. These right here are coming off the bottom to eat my bait, which came down, 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 and that one's getting ready to get caught. The reason I go to the, higher freq uh, the lower frequency is because I want to see my line on top of the screen. I don't want to see it down here. I want to see it right here. It helps me just guide it better. Um, you'll still see it if you left 200 or, or high chirp on, but you might not see it because of the cone size until it gets down here. And then you'll see it go down. I just prefer to see it here. And I do that better with either 83 or medium. It just widens the cone out. A more realistic picture is that one right there. <coughs> 200 kilohertz, 26 foot of water. So that makes the cone on the bottom about eight. <coughs> All these fish are down here in about 20 feet. So that's, uh, you know, seven foot or so distance. But bait fish in blue, bass in red, lines going this way like that. You don't see my line because I just got through catching one. And all those lines that are doing this are fish that came out of this school and chasing my fish to the boat. That's a pretty good scenario right there. That's a pile of them. 90% of the fish, 10% of the lake. Every one of them is right there. I tried going over here. I tried going down there. I tried going here. I tried going here. Didn't find any. Went right back there. That's where they were. That was um, Fontana Lake in North Carolina. Spotted bass, smallmouth. What was strange is that every time I'd go, you'd catch four or five out of them, then they'd stop biting, and then you'd, 
I'd go around and look for some more, and then I'd come back and catch four or five more. And I would never, sometimes they'd be smallmouth, sometimes they'd be spotted bass, but they'd never be mixed. And it was weird. Um, I'd catch like five smallmouth in a row, leave, come back, catch five spots in a row, leave, come. And I don't even know how many I caught. I'm, I'm in a pile going back and forth. But that's pretty good separation. Bottom bait fish, fish, fish swimming up. That's what they look like. Um, I don't remember if I did or not. I know where, I know where it is um, if I ever needed to go back. Um, here's the very same thing with crappie. This is Maine. We were talking about earlier. I'm on 200 kilohertz, so you don't see my line right here until it gets down about six foot. But there's my line of my bait going down. Blotchy red marks, blotchy red marks, blotchy red marks. All this bluish purple is bait. Good separation. Hard bottom, 14 foot of water. Small space. You don't see any fish here. You don't see any there. You see them right here. 90% in 10% of the lake. There's a lot of 10%s here, though. <coughs> Each one of those dots is one of those spots. Pretty unique little place. But that's the difference between what bass look like, what crappie look like, um, and that's the importance of kind of understanding what your sonar is telling you, how to read stuff in the water, and how to effectively catch more fish with it. Um, got one last little thing here for you guys. Um, I recently, I used to have a website um, until I didn't, until they stopped posting websites. So I had a bunch of teaching products on there for you guys to learn more about sonar and stuff. Um, I just found a new platform that I'm able to do what I want to do on it. And I'm going to be hosting some webinars and doing some other stuff. Um, I've got some digital products on there as well that you can learn more about Sonar. I think I'm going to probably do a, at least four webinars this year. And uh, it'll be a lot like this, kind of teaching you guys more about stuff. Um, the first one I think I'm going to do is April 4th. I'm, I'll have it all set up the beginning of the week. But if you guys want to grab a car with the website info, jump on there. And, and there's a little subscribe button that you could put your email in. And, uh, and I'll send you a notification when I'm going to be having programs and classes and stuff that you guys can jump on. So um, appreciate you being out here, coming to the first Alabama Fishing Expo in Gadsden, Alabama. I'm happy to be here. Um, but if you got any fly fishermen, Frank Roden's coming up at 5.30, going to be talking about trout fishing. I never knew you could go trout fishing in Gadsden, Alabama. Did you? <coughs> trout fishing. Nakalula Falls. Is, yeah. Have you been? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty unique place. You go catch a trout in Alabama. So, appreciate you guys being here. Have a great rest of your show and good luck fishing. Huh? Yeah. All right, guys. Like you said, we're going to be talking fly fishing here in about 30 minutes. So, I'm going to sign off again. If you want to join us back again uh, at 530, that'll be the last seminar for the day. Uh, doors close at 7 tonight, open again tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., uh, going till 5, so uh, plenty of time to get on over here and uh, check out everything going on at the Alabama Fishing Show and Expo. It has been a great day. I think the weather's supposed to be kind of nasty, uh, so uh, tomorrow, so... Perhaps a good day to come hang out indoors. All right, guys. We'll see you in a 